You're listening to Big Blend Radio's first Friday toast to the art show with Nancy Reed and Lisa Smith, the mother-daughter travel team and publishers of Big Blend Radio and TV magazine and Parks and Travel magazine. And, of course, we're the travelers on the Love Your Parks tour. And on today's show, we're very excited to have renowned photographer and photojournalist Stan Honda join us to talk about his artist residency experience at Haleakala National Park in Maui, Hawaii. Uh, and this is all through the National Parks Arts Foundation, an awesome nonprofit organization that offers unique month-long artist residencies in national park units across the country. And this is for artists of all kinds. You can be a photographer, a painter, a poet, a writer, filmmaker. You could be doing mixed media, ceramics. It's all there for you to go and apply for these amazing, amazing opportunities. So I encourage you to go to nationalparksartsfoundation.org. We're also very excited to have Tanya Ortega, the founder of NPAF, National Parks Arts Foundation, on the show as well. Um, But Stan, let's say hi to you. Welcome. How are you? Aloha. Uh, I'm yes, great. it is aloha, huh? <laughs> well, you're in <laughs> Haleakala right now. Um, wow. So, you know, tell us what what is, what is your scenery like right now, where where you are? Uh, well, from the uh, housing that I'm staying at, I could see the mountain of of Haleakala. Uh, it's it's actually very foggy. The the weather changes almost minute by minute, and so uh, uh, maybe 30 minutes ago it was bright sunshine, and and now it's like we're in the middle of a cloud because I'm at, I'm at around 7,000 feet right now on, on the mountain. Ooh. Wow. Cool. And you don't think that you always think about, you know, beach and tropical paradise, which Haleakala has that with waterfalls and rainforests. And, um, but it's been really interesting following your blog of your journey and experience in Haleakala. And I encourage everyone to go to your website, stanhonda.com. Everybody is the website to go to. And when you look at Stan's work, if you haven't seen it already, and uh, some iconic images throughout history, um, amazing sky photography so and night photography, so I can't wait to talk to you about that. Um, but I want to bring Tanya Ortega back on the show. How are you? I'm great. Hello, everybody. Hey, where are you? I am on the big <laughs> island. It's the question. Ooh. The first question with Tanya ever, like, is like, where are you? You never know <laughs> where she is. I have I, another question. I am. Yes. Uh oh. Can you do the hula? Yeah, here we go. <laughs> oh, I wish I was that talented. I wish. Have you well, tried? I am. I am down near South Point, the southernmost point in the hmm. United States. And, you know, we we haven't put this out on our residencies, but I think this residency might be the southernmost art residency in the United States. We should probably check on that. But I'm at the southern, very southern tip. If you Google it, you'll be able to see people jumping off cliffs into the ocean. Mm -hmm. Um, It's beautiful down here, incredibly beautiful. Whales are migrating. It's incredible. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay, so like I'm feeling like you know our, our Love Your Parks tour is officially on. We're on and off and running. You know, right now I know we're recording this interview. We're in Yuma, Arizona, in the Yuma Crossing National Heritage Area, and um, it's it's really amazing, like that we're all connecting <laughs> from all these different levels <laughs> in park areas. You know, and uh, I just think it's exciting that you know, Stan, we're we're probably we're in the sunniest place on the earth here in Yuma, Arizona. It's Guinness World Book of Records says, hey, you are the sunniest place. And wow. um, I know, and you're mm-hmm. like 7,000 feet up, and you, I mean, that goes up to 10,000 feet in Haleakala, right? Right. The summit's at 10,000, I think it's 10,023 feet at the very top of the volcano. Wow. So wow. this is it. You're in the volcano, but you still have rainforest, even though you have a volcano. Well, the rainforests are further down in, in elevation, more towards sea level. Up here, it's it's a high desert. So if you were mm. going to the, the Grand Canyon, it'd be a similar environment. Uh, w- without the, mm. without the trees, without the pine mm. trees, there's uh, the the trees are are not native to this to the islands, and so mm-hmm. it's it's a very similar to the high deserts of the Southwest. Wow. Okay. So we're all kind of connected in this way. And Tanya, you can take that on too from Santa Fe, <laughs> right? True. Right. Yes. All right. Well, you know, we're, we're, we could swim over to Mexico from here because we almost walked there the other day. We could day. walk, actually. It's like two <laughs> steps. I know. Yeah. It's cool. 
Dan, this is so exciting about your career, your work as a photojournalist. Um, you know, you've captured one of the most iconic images from 9-11 and it, things like that, right? And then also uh, have a book called Moving Walls, the Barracks of America's Concentration Camps. Um, mm. So you have these really serious subjects that you've captured over the years. And then at the flip side of it, you're going off into parks. Um, this isn't your first. Uh, park residency at all. You've done Grand Canyon, Hupatki, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Rocky Mountain, yeah. which we're excited to get to, mm. and Chaco as well with the National Parks Arts Foundation. So is that your balance <laughs> to to keep that kind of the, the the subjects that you capture? Yeah, it's it sort of worked out that way just career-wise. Uh, most of my career I spent doing photojournalism, and there's uh, – two projects that I was partially working on uh, when I was a full-time photojournalist. And one of them is the night sky photography in the parks. And the other was about the, the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. Mm. Um, and so now, now I'm able to work independently and work more um, in depth on, on these two ideas that I have. This is it's interesting, and I wanted to talk to Tanya about this, about um, this process. I know that Stan has been with NPAF before through uh, Chaco going out there. This selection mm-hmm. process, I mean, it's like, you know, to me it would be hands down. Stan's applying, yes. <laughs> I mean, because you look at his work and it's like, <laughs> like, dude. <laughs> so, oh, he's amazing. I, yeah. Tell us about well, that. Well, thanks. Amazing. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, it's just a matter of the uh, at least with the with the different national parks, the application process is slightly different. I, it gets more standardized with the NPAF, and uh, the uh, I, for me it was just a matter of deciding what I wanted to do. And and lately I've been uh, the proposal that I've been doing is is just about photographing the, the night sky over the park and mm-hmm. and seeing that as a resource that that the parks help help protect uh, our mm-hmm. view our view of the night sky which is really disappearing since cities are getting mm-hmm. bigger and there's more art, more and more artificial yeah. light uh really just drowning out the the light of the stars and that's something interesting because i was reading that you are one of these photographers who are, you've managed to photograph the night sky even in new york city how do you do that, uh, that yeah that's uh, I sort of say that on my uh, on my on the website. Well, um, there there's a lot to see. No, really, no matter where you are, you could you could obviously see bright things like the moon and the planets. Uh, occasionally, we see the sun. Uh, it ha- hasn't been too much lately. Um, but th- there's uh, when I'm in New York, uh, people often ask what I what I photograph or in terms of in terms for the night sky, and I, I just treat the skyline as the landscape. We, have, we don't have mountains or lakes or pine trees in New York City, but we have a we have a really pretty interesting skyline. Uh, mm. And so I use that as my landscape and mainly photograph various phases of the moon if they're conjunctions of, of planets or planets and, and the moon. Uh, we actually did a, a photograph the lunar eclipse um, early last year, uh, right around New Year's, there was a a, a total eclipse of the of the moon in New York. It was a, we just saw a partial eclipse for I don't mm-hmm. know, maybe 20 minutes, 20 minutes right mm-hmm. around sunrise, and uh, so a few of us managed to photograph a, uh, an eclipse from Central Park. So that that was something that was that was to me was pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. Oh, I loved those photos, Dan. That was in, that was incredible when I saw those. Yeah. yeah, thanks. I mean, I think it's it's kind of a matter of, of uh, I, I kind of approach it the same way as I do a lot of the residency, just scout out a location when where you think the moon or the planets will be, and then you go back at night and and um, uh, mm-hmm. and, and and try to try to photograph the scene. Speaking of the moon, looking at your images in Haleakala, um, you got the moon set um, up in the summit. When you're up in the summit, so you've got like the clouds, which looks like an ocean. The clouds look like an ocean while you're up there, yeah. and then the moon. You know, if you didn't think twice and and stop and really look, you'd go the the tide's rolling in, but you're not on the beach. You're you're way up. Yeah, this is the the, the for me a little strange, but the the interesting thing about Haleakala is that, especially at the summit, you're at ten thousand feet, and oftentimes 
the cloud layer is at six or seven thousand feet or even lower. So mm -hmm. you're you're standing above a layer, a pretty big layer of clouds, almost like you're flying in an airplane. It's sort of that sensation when you're looking down on a uh, on a layer of clouds. And you're right, yeah, that's it's not the ocean. It's it's uh, it's clouds uh, above both the sea and, and above the rest of Maui, uh, which which is below you. What tell me about the plant that you were photographing? Because when you talk about high desert, it definitely looks like that to me. You know, Nancy and I lived in a Joshua Tree area, and this. This, the this, the terrain is a different color. You know, it's got that, that reddish and dark, you know. Well, parts of the Mojave Desert have that too. Um, but you have these plants, the silver sword, that you're photographing. And it's really interesting because you, you're doing it with the stars in the background, and then the plants are all lit up. It's just such a, an amazing, I mean, to me it's amazing how you, it. I feel like we're underwater, but these are like mystical plants. They're like magic plants. They're like yuccas almost in a way. Like, Yeah, they're really, really unusual plants. Uh, the Hawaiian name is Ahina Hina. Uh, that, that's the, the name in Hawaiian for the silver sword. And apparently it's, it's a relative of the sunflower plant. Really? And somehow, yeah, somehow eons ago, uh, a sunflower seed found its way to Hawaii and then it, it adapted to the conditions apparently and, and, and ended up in what the plant that you see in the in the picture, which is uh, kind of very thin, sword-shaped, uh, silver-covered leaves, which apparently help help it fight off the the really intense sun uh, at at the altitudes that it it lives at. Mm. And a lot of uh, what I do with a lot of the trips that I take is try to plan the trips around the phases of the moon. And I know that around just before, or just after new moon, when there's a crescent moon, it it puts out enough light where it'll light up the landscape, and you could photograph that at, at night. In fact, like a first quarter moon, you could probably take a hike uh, along a level trail without a flashlight. There's there's enough light. Um, as a and as a photojournalist, I I didn't use much artificial light. I depended a lot on available light and. I'm just sort of continuing that philosophy when I'm shooting in the parks and in wilderness areas and um, not using any artificial light, but using the natural light, which is at night is the, is the light of a, of a moon, whatever phase that, it, that it's in. And I think the pictures that you saw, the, the landscape was being lit up um, by a moon. So you get this interesting quality of a light. It's, it's essentially sunlight, but it's a much different look, look to it um, at, at night. And especially the the silver sword plant, when it when the moonlight hits it, it it it's a very eerie look at night. I like it. It's just I feel like we're on the moon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> looking at it, you know. Yeah, because uh, it really it really stands out against that environment. Uh, the the uh, basically the uh, soil and rocks created by the lava. Hmm. I, I, I'm I'm I want to go hiking there. I know I'm just like this is so cool. And I think Tanya, this is something important too. Where where MPAF, the National Parks Arts Foundation, what what you're doing is so cool because it's you're so open to all media. And this is one of those night sky photography is a big deal. And I think it's an important role. Like Stan was saying, it's an important role that the National Park Service plays in regards to protecting. That is a big part. It's also showcasing that parks are also at night. The, the experience at night. I know park rangers over the years being on our shows and us going to parks they're always like, come out for ranger led park tours. We'll take you through at night and you'll see a whole different set of animals. Nancy, we did that in Africa all the time. Mm. We'd go out yeah. at night. You'd see it animals way hunting. More fun. I know. Well, and I, I, I have some good more. news yeah. on that front. At we five like different parks, we have five different parks committed to doing night sky photography, artist in residence. Really? So, cool. you know, there is the That's international great. designation, the night sky designation. They will be specifically night sky parks. So um, thank you, Stan, for a whole bunch of people because of your program and different parks just got a hold of us and demanded it. So we are obligated and happy to do it. 
<laughs> wow. But this is awesome. This is awesome yeah, wow. because cool. I, I don't think people realize the pollution levels that we've created and the importance of having clean, dark skies. And that really, it's kind of like a thermometer, right? Stan, when you photograph at, at night and go out, you can see what the level of, you know, pollution levels and also like there is a light pollution. Uh, you can tell the health of a region by what you do. Yeah, it could because the um, especially at night you could definitely tell how much light pollution there is. And when you walk around a town or a city, if you look at street lights or even house lights, uh, n- notice where they're pointed because a lot of a lot of lights throw off uh, at least fifty percent or more light up into the sky, where mm-hmm. it doesn't do any real good. It's just wasted electricity and money really going up into the sky, and then it it affects our view of of the sky. And I mean, the view of the stars is just really part of human heritage and humans have been using the sky to navigate and tell stories and, and uh, be, it's just part of our, our being really. And, and to lose that view is just, um, it's just really kind of terrible. It it is. It's Mm. sad because it's a whole other thing. It's like going underwater, right? When we go snorkeling or scuba diving, you see this whole other world. And that's what the night sky is like. You know, you get to see things that you don't see during the day. In the day, it's like, oh, look at the cloud formations or sunrise and sunset, you know, which we're addicted to. But So I think it's really cool what you're doing. You're playing a huge role in that. The other thing is that you went around, you know, um, outside the park doing things and getting images and working with different people. Um, which I think is really cool. Tanya, that's something I did want to touch on with you because I know even Sarah Whedon, when she was in Death Valley, went here, there, and everywhere. So when an artist comes into a park for a month, they're not necessarily just staying in the month, uh, in, within the, you know, the con- confines of the national park. It, they are able to go around and do other things um, so that they – they have that connection. You know how Nancy and I was trying to connect the park with the community. Um, I feel like you're doing the same thing through through these residencies of of connecting what's on the outside and the inside. That's exactly correct. I mean, where would we be if artists couldn't uh, explore and make that connection, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and as far as like especially Hawaii with the eruption last year, um, you know, it, it started in the park and it went outside of the park at Haleakala, the night sky that Stan is doing. Yes, you get a better view of the night sky at the summit, but the rest of the community has this beautiful night sky too. And and they're the gateway community that, that's involved in keeping, preserving the park, making sure it go, you know, all kinds of things. So it is, um, yeah, uh, I think it's important that people know their surroundings geographically. They can choose to stay in a park. I mean, if you're at somewhere like, you know, Death Valley or Chaco, it's a, it's a little bit harder to, um, or even an island um, in the middle of the ocean, you know, you're not going to go out as much. But then uh, after those, we have community events. In like mm-hmm. Key West, for instance. Um, so yeah, people can do artists. Come on, they can do whatever they want, pretty much, as long as it's within the park. Uh, if they're in the park, within the rules and regulations of the park. Stan, I heard that Tanya hooked you up <laughs> with, with, with some specialists. <laughs> with, with some what? I, I said I heard that Tanya hooked you up with, um, got you some connections uh, to go out and. You you went off um, out of the out of the park itself and went to like an observatory and you got hooked up with all kinds of specialists and so um, you did some really good you know adventures outside of the park itself. Oh yeah, what uh, at the at the summit actually very close to the summit of the national park is something called the Haleakala Observatories. It's a it's a whole set of telescopes. Um, and that cool. the, the public just doesn't have, have access to. It's actually on the road uh, to oh, get wow. to the summit. Uh, but she got in contact with the Institute for Astronomy um, from the University of Hawaii. They're the group that's – they're kind of a consortium of a lot of universities that help run the observatories. And through a, a few different administrators, they put me in touch with a man named Rob who uh, operates some of the telescopes up on – uh, at the observatories. So he was my guy. They said, well, Rob will help you. 
And I just described what I wanted to do as uh, I'm an artist in residence here at Haleakala, but I'd like to uh, get closer to some of the observatory domes and photograph the, the night sky from from the observatory area. And so uh, he, he allowed me in and they said, well, you could really kind of go wherever you want. So I was able to get some pretty good pictures, like you saw, I think, on the blog of, mm. of the, the uh, telescope domes. And there's a brand new solar telescope there that's on the, on the cutting edge of research there. So it, to me, it was I'm, I'm real interested in a, astronomy. I, since I was a little kid, I was real interested in astronomy. So uh, for me, it's fascinating to see, to see all these observatories and uh, to, to have a view from there and with, with the sky behind it is pretty remarkable. Mm. I wanted to ask, going there, how much preparation did you do beforehand? And then when you get there, is it, is it, does it align up with the preparation? How much reading do you do and uh, work, you know, like, hey, I know Nancy, when we travel somewhere, one of us is mm-hmm. doing the research, right? Normally Nancy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> There's the research okay. part. And then you get there and you go, okay, I'm going to toss all this research out, but this is coming into play, and then I'm going to learn a whole bunch more. Yeah, I try to do quite quite a bit, especially into what what I'll be seeing in the sky. Things change from uh, season to season, but also from from day to day. So I'll, I'll do a lot of uh, looking at star charts and the calendar and the moon phases just to figure out where I should be on certain parts of the park uh, and looking which and looking which direction to get I think some interesting photos. Um, and that's what I did with the. The, the hike into the, the crater where I photographed the plants at night is I, I picked the three days that I thought would be uh, good in terms of the moonlight. Um, mm-hmm. But also the, uh, one of the rangers, uh, Honey Girl Duman at, here at the park uh, sent me a lot of information, a lot of park service pamphlets about geology and plants and birds here. Uh, plus some cultural information uh, about Hawaii, the language and the, and the culture. So that, that helped quite a bit in just kind of understanding Hawaii and Haleakala and, uh, and, and what, what I would expect. I, I didn't really know, like I was telling her, I, I didn't really know what I would expect when I was here. And uh, it sort of completely exceeded what I thought I would see uh, in, mm. in that term. So every, cause I mean, every, every day you see something new and, and fortunately um the, the residency lasted a, a month, so it gives you quite a bit of time to uh, explore around and maybe spend a little bit more time trying to discover new things than you would on a shorter trip. Mm. When you talk about the cultural connections, too, did you find any cultural connections to the sky and the celestial world? You know, because I know, you know, in countries we've lived in and even here in the States, you know, the native cultures, there's always a connection to the sky and what the planets mean and the star means and the stars mean, um, and, and there's, you know, folk tales that come from it. Did you find any of that? A little bit. Yeah. They, they, um, they showed me a star chart of the, of the March sky, what we, what, what we would see up in the sky during the month of March with the Hawaiian names to the stars and the constellations, And, uh, and that, that helped a little bit in understanding uh, I think what ancient Hawaiians were thinking. Uh, plus, there's a lot of um, a lot of books about the Polynesians who eventually settled here in, in Hawaii, and just the navigational uh, methods that they used. I mean, part of it were stars, and part of it were was um, the, the ocean currents and, and the waves. But uh, I, I think the uh, it, it was interesting to see things like this star chart with the Hawaiian names and and what they mm-hmm. what they see in the constellations uh, as well. Mm. So this were, is a very oh, so, go ahead, Nancy. Okay, that's asking. If, it, were the constellations different than constellations that you know about? Uh, no, the funny thing, that's what I asked. That was one of the questions I mm. asked. Um, did do they have different constellations? And for the most yeah. part, they, uh, they they follow the. The constellations that we know, which uh, some okay. date from Greek and Roman times, and, okay. and it's basically European, European based. Yeah. But they have different names for them and kind of different um, ideas oh. behind them. What I mean, the, the the biggest example, especially now and in, in, at this time of year, the constellation Orion is pretty visible from, if you're in the northern hemisphere yeah. uh, once, once yeah. the sun sets. 
and um, in the in the European telling, the Orion is a hunter. Uh, but in the Hawaiian story, the shape of Orion is this string game that children play where they loop a string around their fingers. And it's apparently the the pattern of the stars is the same oh. pattern that you would see on this loop of string for for the children's game. So that's that's just a, a different look at the, the same pattern of stars but it's up the in the sky. Same pat- that's cool. You know, I would think yeah. that different societies and cultures – would see something different when they look at the stars that relates to how they are living. Usually, you know? usually they do that. The, the the Polynesians used individual stars to navigate, so they weren't really concerned with the constellations or the pattern of the stars. They were concerned mm. with well, mainly the North Star and a star called Arcturus, which is mm-hmm. um, very very high overhead at at midnight, uh, depending yeah. on where you are in the Pacific Ocean. Um, and and so those, those were helping them navigate. I, I know that the when I was at Chaco Culture, that I learned about the the Navajo sky mm-hmm. and the, the Navajo have have an entirely different set of actual constellations. They see different patterns uh, from from the stars that we that we cool. see, and they're not necessarily the constellations that that we're familiar with. It's like yeah, because languages. I was thinking that you have Ursa Major, Ursa Minor as bears. And then there's places where there are no bears. So how's somebody in a place that has no bears going to look up in the sky and go, "Oh, that looks like a bear." Yeah, you know. Right. I mean in 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 England in uh in Great Britain, the the big dipper is a plow. It's not a it's not a dipper. Oh, cool. It's a plow. And so so I mean that that's one one example of a, of a different name for the same pattern. Oh, so. wow. No, you just cleared up something for me because when I was a kid and we lived in England, I remember yeah. them calling it the plow, and I was like, "Wait!" And then oh, yeah. here they're calling. Now I never knew it was the same thing. Duh. You oh, okay, know. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, because the the sky. I mean, I mean uh, assuming a relatively dark sky, uniform dark sky, wherever you are in the world, the, the stars will be the same no matter where you are. The, yeah. the, the stars that form these patterns are relatively bright. That's why humans see these patterns because they're the brighter stars, um, mm-hmm. and it just depends on what what you see. And also, what what time of night you're out there? Here, if you go out after sunset and it gets dark, the dipper is sort of on its handle. And if you wait till mm-hmm. midnight, it's it's sort of it's it's kind of upside down, like like things are falling out of the handle. And if you wait mm-hmm. another three hours until the middle, like before dawn, um, it's over. The dipper part is along the bottom, and the handle is is way up in the up in. Uh, vertically up, mm. up in the well, sky. I was going to say sky, but it's always in the sky. So kind of depends on when you're out and, and actually looking up at the sky. Wow. It's so cool. You just opened my mind. Like it's like a, here's a different road map and it was different languages according to your region, but it's the same map, you know, but it, yeah, this is so cool. Now, did yeah, you see any nanes? Then... This is important. The nanes. Oh, and then it, oh yeah, yeah, they're uh, they're they're cute. They're um they're I guess they the bite. size of geese or small small geese and the the, the ones I saw seem pretty content on just eating eating the grass or wherever they were mm-hmm. <laughs> what they were eating. Um mm. and then we've been uh, told they're extremely aggressive because they're like uh, probably, mini geese. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, they they're they're Hawaiian geese. They're they're just a yeah. variety of geese, geese and geese small. Yeah. They they yeah. probably can be aggressive if you're aggressive mm. toward them, but but I think usually they're just trying trying to eat and eat. and they 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 cross the roads a lot, so there are a lot of uh, uh, signs with the birds on them telling you to be be careful as you're driving because mm. the birds could suddenly cross the road in front of you. And watch where you step because you know. <laughs> yes. Just saying. <laughs> Just saying, I know about geese. <laughs> I, just, yeah, I did that yeah, this morning. A... So I'm just okay, saying. Right. I love geese. Yeah, I, you could go sliding so in a cool. fresh one very quickly. But, uh, uh-huh. you know, that that just happens. Tanya, um, so Hawaii, you've got a lot. You've got Haleakala and then the volcanoes. That's also, I mean, two major national parks that's part of NPAF's residencies. And it's open to all artists, right? Oh, yes, all artists. We, uh, you know, performance artists, writers, poets, um, everybody, absolutely everybody. It's just so, you know, our panel is chosen on, even if we get, let's just say, one saxophone player, we'll get a panelist who knows about that to be able to uh, 
to evaluate it. So absolutely everybody. And I think you guys are going to be pretty excited to see who's uh, coming down the pipe. The pipe. How do you say it? Cool. Um, and we've, the we've just been discussing the pipe, the pike, I'm not sure. We've just been discussing what um, cl- kind of floors we need for dancers. So, oh, so uh, this is the house. Cool. The house you're talking about. Oh, the wow. house in, in, oh, yeah. in Hawaii Volcanoes. I mean, so you've got the recording thing that you're doing, or like a little recording, mini recording studio for musicians. Uh, so this is an important mm-hmm. thing. And um, so a floor for dancers. So this is so cool. And so sometimes you're, you're staying outside the park, which is what happens in volcanoes, right? You have an art B&B with six people. You have ocean <laughs> views. Like, seriously, like, you know. Oh, yeah, well, it depends on, you know, it depends on what, um, what the, the park can offer the artists and what they have. Apparently at Haleakala, it's pretty, pretty great. So um, at Hawaii <laughs> Volcanoes, it was, you know, the, the eruption kind of, you know, the park was closed. So our program got to forge ahead because we were able to get a place that was mm-hmm. outside of the park. So some of them are outside of the park. Um, if it's, if it's, uh, I mean, technically, the artist's residence here is five minutes from the Kahuku unit of the park. It's it's down the road quite a bit from the visitor center, but it, it kind of abuts the park, to be totally mm-hmm. honest, because the park is so big. But, um, yeah, some, some we take outside the park. I mean, for instance, at Glen Canyon, there's um, a few different locations that we're looking at, and one of them doesn't have... Uh, any any park housing, so we have to look at alternatives. Wow! So you guys we, are just you, all encompassing and go for it. I love that about it because you know it's every park you place is different. You know, Nancy and I know that from some of the places we've been in. It's like mm-hmm. you're out in the middle of nowhere, and basically you're going to have to trek in an hour or two to get there sometimes. Um, but when you're there, you're like, wow, look at this. This is a magical place. Stan, um, are you going to apply for another one, another residency? Oh, oh yeah, definitely. Um, I've, I've kind of concentrated more on the American Southwest because that's where the darker skies are. And then when I saw mm-hmm. the opportunity for Haleakala, I thought, wow, this is, this is great because I, I heard a lot about the, about the park. I wouldn't mind coming back to Haleakala, but, yeah, I, uh, I think I definitely want to apply for future residencies in the in whatever parks are available. And I I saw that you did a couple events, and I know that happens in, with these residencies that there's a workshop or an event where the public can connect with you, which is always so great. Um, and you sold out both of them, from what I saw. Yeah, we we plan to do uh, the usually I I do a few talks. And sometimes the night sky photography workshop, and so we had, we planned one mm-hmm. uh, one e- one evening workshop, um, and then they cool. uh, that sold up pretty quick, and so they the park asked mm-hmm. me if I could do a second one, so we did a uh, a second one the following night, so we had a Saturday Sunday evening uh, uh, nice. workshops, and uh, basically I showed people how to how to do the night sky photography. It's just it's kind of just mm-hmm. this very short and quick lesson, but a lot of people bring their cameras to the national park because they want to take a lot of pictures. Uh, we happen to get uh, quite a few people from Maui to sign up for the park. So people who that already live here and they, they could just essentially drive up to the park mm. uh, uh, when, whenever they want to uh, and, and do the photography. So uh, they, they were real interested in it. Do you find that um, when, when you talk about that with night sky photography, I mean, it, it's, people having to understand light and shutter speed, and that's kind of like, okay, whoa, don't we just point and click? So it's different now, especially with digital photography, right, compared to back in the days of film. Well, it's not really different. I, I think the one the one big uh, thing that's happening recently with the digital cameras is that most adults have never taken a photography class. The people that buy mm-hmm. the cameras, because it's they're so automatic that they're not really sure – they're not really aware of the fundamentals of photography, like what an F-stop right. is or a shutter speed. Mm. And so uh, it, the skill level kind of varies for, uh, all over the place in these workshops. And the one thing that with the, with the night sky photography, it's, it's sort of a special type of photography in that 
yeah. that you can't use you can't use any of the automatic settings on your camera because that none of them will work at night because there's it's just so dark there's nothing to focus on the light levels are extremely dim and uh, and mm-hmm. so people have to just have a little understanding of how to set the shutter speed and the f-stop on their camera to, to, to be able to compensate for that and once they get the hang of that then it's then then they're having fun mm. wow that, that's it get it off of the automatic <laughs> the automatic uh, yeah. i always think of it as opening a door how much light are you going to let in how many strangers yeah. are you letting in so you open the door a crack or you open it wide and it makes a difference with the exposure on the other side. Yeah, that's a great thing. analogy. Yeah, I wonder, can I use that in the next uh, <laughs> workshop? Sure. That's a great, <laughs> that's a great way. And then, uh, yeah, just trying to explain people mm. what you need to do to get a lot of light. I mean, the stars right. are very, very dim to get that light mm. uh, onto your camera sensor so that you get a picture. Mm. Yeah. Man, it's 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 really neat what you can do with digital photography. But I want to go to Tanya real quick on this because Tanya, you you know about building box cameras and doing that. Would would yeah. you be able to do that kind of photography with the cameras that you? Oh you my built? gosh, she'd be out there all night. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's she's known to stay in the play, her location and and you know stay overnight to figure it out. <laughs> That's entirely true. I mean, I, yeah. I told you guys about um, years ago when I was in that Kiva, and yeah. um, I had my 4 by 5 in there, and I heard the scariest sound. I was by myself <laughs> in the middle of the night in the Kiva. My, 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 um, I mean, you know, having taken different cultural um, programs and things like this, and I had permission, and... Um, I heard the scariest sound. Just did. Do you remember the story? It was so scary, and it echoed while I was down in this kiva in the middle of the night, and I was shooting night sky. And so I heard the same sound from the other side of the kiva above ground. It was like this, ooh, like this. I couldn't even. It was so scary. And they, and it was like these these things were talking. And I peeked my head. I climbed up the stairs, and I looked, and it was an entire herd of elk had surrounded oh, wow. me and I was stuck in this Kiva all night long taking photos. I mean, I wanted to be there for an hour or two. I mean, I'm really glad I had my winter garb uh, with me and some snacks, but I was surrounded by an entire herd of elk. I mean, there had to have been 40 at least. And I had to wait until morning until they stopped talking to each other and they all woke up and went away. Um, and then, you know, the, I, I walked out, I went to the Rangers and I'm like, you know, maybe I should have a CB or something <laughs> out there. I just spent the night, Wait. but I got some great shots. I got some great night by accident wow. with real film with a four by five camera that I had made, That's funny. you know, um, I got some, some pretty good shots, but I was mostly just scared because I had never really listened to elk for hours on end. I thought, who knows, you know, I thought I was going to die. Yeah. Okay, um, elk versus yeah. nene, that's the thing now. Okay, <laughs> digital versus <laughs> film. It's elk versus the nene. Who's going to hurt you more? <laughs> okay, Lisa, remember remember us going through the wildebeest, the wildebeest migration and it's like, oh, you mean I have to stop the car? You will stop the car, and then you will sit there for four to five hours while they put their noses on on the windows of the car, and they push, they push and the you car. Vibrate. <laughs> and you vibrate. You oh, vibrate, wow. and they're like, oh, 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 <laughs> and you're like, okay, shall we open the window? Well, okay. <laughs> no, I did, and then their heads come in the car, and it's and they they. They, how can I uh-uh. politely say this? They drool on you, <laughs> mm. and it smells wonderful. <laughs> they snort and drool, and there's body fluids. It's the, the coolest f- experience. Anybody who gets to experience it's the so wildebeest cool. migration, I encourage you to do it. It will blow your mind. But you it will see crazy. things that you don't want to see, like you know, babies going down with crocodiles, you know, that yeah, kind of thing do, yeah. in the but, river. But but it's like that's and you will throw life. away your clothes if you yeah, open the you window and their heads come. You will throw away your clothes and, and change cars think. later. Yes, <laughs> that's it. That's <laughs> it. 
thank you both for joining us on the show, Stan. It's so exciting, and and your blog. I'm so glad you blogged while you're there. I think that's so awesome when people do that because it's a, such a unique experience that you had, and um, I, you just opened my mind to like a whole different world of the night sky. And I appreciate that, and, and thank mm. you for that. Uh, with what you do, and also uh, and on the other side of the coin of your photography, really appreciate what you're doing with your book, Moving Walls, the Barracks of America's Concentration Camps, everyone. Uh, oh, go to wow. stanhonda.com yeah. and look up that. Being in Hawaii, did that kind of connect with, with the history that you're doing in regards to uh, the Japanese Americans um, during World War II? Did you connect with that while you were there? Here at Haleakala, no, uh, but but um, I'm actually t- uh, on Sunday. I'm headed to Honolulu. I got invited to the Iolani School in Hol- Honolulu to speak to the students there next week. Oh, wonderful! Uh, about yeah, about mainly about photography, photojournalism, but also the work that I was I'm doing um, with the Japanese American history. So they're they're very interested in that. Uh, mm-hmm. So I'll be able to connect with students uh, students there uh, about uh, about different topics. Mm, I, mm. I'm I'm really glad you're doing that. And again, Tanya, see how it just keeps spreading out, right? That's what happens with these residencies. It just never stops. One month it's equals fantastic. like years. Yeah. It just keeps going. It's all the ripple effect. <laughs> just keeps flowing, man. You create your own river. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Go. You know, so I, I really appreciate that. Again, everyone, StanHonda.com, uh, artists, musicians, poets, filmmakers. I'm going to do a song. I'm going to write a song <laughs> for this. Uh, <laughs> go to NationalParksArtsFoundation.org and look at all the different opportunities and get on it right away. Don't wait. Uh, sign up for their newsletter because uh, residencies come and go real fast. And really, Stan, um, the, the submission process, that difficult? It's pretty easy, right? for people to submit their their resume and and say, hey, this is what I want to do in this park. Yeah, I think if you've got an idea of what you really want to work on and can summarize that in in a page, in one one page, and you've got samples of your artwork, then uh, the the, uh, NPAF process is fairly easy online. You could, you just upload the the information and the files and, and then, then you wait for uh, an answer and you hope you get a, a a phone Mm. call from Tanya. And if not, <laughs> it, just keep trying because sometimes it takes a few times. You know, it just depends on who's submitting, when and what and how. So just keep going. Don't quit. Don't ever give up on it because right. it's like magic. This is cool. Like, look at Haleakala, man. It's amazing where you were and, and Chaco, you know. Uh, so I, I just, everyone, just do it. If you can get out there and do it and take a month and go, like, hello, Tanya, we're coming to Hawaii to see you. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've got to make that happen. Uh, everyone, NationalParksArtsFoundation.org. They're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Go to StanHonda.com. And we always like to play music for our guests. And this, because you're in, in Maui, we have to play one of my favorite songs. It's called One Maui Sunset. It's by the Tall Men Group, and it's off of their album called Too Tall. There's a lot of tall men involved in this. Uh, but there you can also pack. go to their <laughs> well, yeah, you can go to their website, tallmengroup.weebly.com, but here it is, One Maui Sunset. Thanks for joining us, Dan and Tanya. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thanks. Thanks a lot. You take care. Safe travels back. Okay. Drops on the window Blurry the view One Maui sunset I knew It was for me This gift From you Floating on water Breathing out in air, Sailing on Trade winds Your heart shining through I'm one now It's sunset away From you
yellow on crimson, crying on kill. One hour sunset I knew I'd find myself thinking of you. Rays of light, grays and blues, only the tide knows the truth. Sunset away from you. One now it turns I felt myself falling through. I'm one Maui sunset away Thank you for this beautiful day One Maui sunset away From you 